Dr. Gregory Zako was released from his job as the NRC after Fukushima because he wouldn't approve a nuclear power plant, and they decided to. He has since been appointed to a post on a congressional panel overseeing the National Nuclear Security Administration. Please welcome Dr. Gregory Yachko. Wait, what? He got fired because he wouldn't allow Volvo to have new military industrial complex nuclear power plant, and then they appoint him to the security of the military industrial nuclear power plant. For the plants. next nine months, a period of time that I think is unprecedented in the studies, analysis, and models that are done about nuclear power plant accidents. Shouldn't you be checking with Allison McFarland before you make those kind of statements, Gregory? She just testified in Congress a couple of days ago in 2014. There's no models anywhere to be found. Because the cost of Fukushima, might I remind you, is pretty much immeasurable, and the benefits of avoiding that is pretty much immeasurable. We're also closely coordinating with other U.S. federal and state agencies regarding information about current concentrations of radioactive contamination in the Pacific Ocean. Based on the best scientific information available, no agency in the United States or abroad has identified any evidence of concerns for U.S. food and water supply or public health. For the next nine months, a period of time that I think is unprecedented in the studies, analysis, and models that are done about nuclear power plant accidents. Still in an accident state? That would mean someone's running around flicking switches? Or there's hope? Or there's a possibility? There's no possibility even getting inside of those buildings, okay? You can't get in those buildings. They're sprayed with plutonium and uranium rods from the MOX fuel in that number three, the first melted reactor you see in front of you. There's a novel idea, melted reactors. Not accident state, melted reactors. It's never coming out of the accident state. The Fukushima reactors continue to be fundamentally in an accident condition. How can you call that a serious accident when it's three melted cores? Serious accident means they salvage something. They don't salvage anything there. The entire country of Japan is polluted. The Pacific Ocean is polluted. You had iodine 181 times above acceptable levels in California. Three reactors ultimately underwent severe accidents at the Fukushima site. See, that's interesting. He says severe accidents, and then the next pictures they show you are melted simulations of the cores. It's the most twisted thing you can imagine. Why not just tell us the truth? What do you think, we're stupid? And of course, this was an issue, and perhaps Peter Bradford will talk more about it. This was an issue that developed at Three Mile Island as the fuel melt began. Mm -hmm. So Three Mile Island has a um, fuel melting, but with 100% meltdowns, they are an emergency state. It's the twistedest thing I've ever heard. Why not tell us the truth, Jack? Oh, why not tell us the truth? So what this accident fundamentally should be telling us is that for nuclear power plants to be considered safe, nuclear power plants should not produce accidents like this. And by should not, I don't mean that they have a low probability or that they have a very little likelihood or that they have a one in 10 million year probability. I mean simply that they should not be able to produce accidents like this. That is what the public has said quite clearly after the Fukushima accident, and that is, I think, quite clearly what we need to use as a new safety standard for nuclear power going forward. The way forward would be to take 4,800 peer review academic studies that are published every single day and locked away at Ellsworth, Springer, and Wiley, take those professors and institutions and put them to work on renewable resources and energies. That would be the way forward. What he's talking about is salvaging a death machine on this planet. Academics submit the results of their research projects to a journal whose editors then send a manuscript out to other academics in the same field for peer review studies. If the article passes this stage, the editors often require researchers to put thousands of pounds if they go over a certain number of pages, or if they want to include color diagrams. 
Once these fees are paid, the research is published and made available in print and online to anyone willing to pay for access. A standalone subscription to one of Ulster's most expensive journals will cost you 15000 a year. A lot of universities will spend $1.7 million for a bundle of Elsevier's journals. But the three big publishing houses, Elsevier, Springer and Wiley, own most of the world's 20,000 academic journals and account for 42% of all journal articles published. Now, at the NRC, during the accident... There are unprecedented 100% meltdowns never seen before. Greg, man, you're something else. The NRC came up with a number of recommendations of areas that needed to be improved. All plants are leaking toxins right into your community. All plants are leaking, on purpose, toxins right into your ocean. All plants, fuel pools, boil off. That releases all those isotopes into your community and your environment. All plants produce radioactive material that are turned into bullets and fired into poor people's countries and each one of those bullets are dirty bombs. First of all, I'd like to mention that DU, depleted uranium, had a prior name, and it was Dolram. All the military manuals refer to it as Dolram, D-U-L-L-R-A-M, which is depleted uranium, low-level radioactive material. Well, they so eloquently removed the L-L-R-A-M and just call it depleted uranium now, and remove the low-level radiation part of it, uniquely enough. I don't know how they got to go hide that part. I don't know where the science was that allowed them to take those last four parts of the acronym off. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, the United States Army, command staff at the Pentagon, and Schwarzkopf and Zulus told me to clean up the depleted uranium mess. They recalled me to active duty as the depleted uranium project director to develop all the training and education necessary to make our troops safe and NATO troops safe when they use it. They ordered me to develop the environmental cleanup procedures and we found out that for each single vehicle I'd have to take that vehicle, physically remove it, and then scrape all the dirt down to six inches out to 400 meter radius in order to make it safe. The highway of death, ladies and gentlemen, is a toxic wasteland depleted uranium mess as we speak. The Seattle Post Intelligencer Larry Johnson just wrote an article, and we worked on talk with him. They went over, they measured the contamination physically at the site, and it was a thousand times permissible. Had nothing to do with the U.S. Army measurement. That's your own local newspaper and your congressman. You can't take radioactive materials and deliberately and willfully throw them in somebody else's backyard, deliberately and willfully deny medical care to the U.S. veterans, the heroes of our nation, you can't deliberately and willfully deny medical care or the protocols to the enemy soldiers because according to the Geneva Conventions, if I shoot the enemy and he survives, I've got to provide him medical care. Fearing that the troops would revolt as they had in Vietnam and turn the guns around on the officers until the day they actually went to engage in Kuwait, they didn't issue them any live rounds. Then because they know that body counts is a problem and as those go up, the opposition to the war would grow, they developed a strategy that I believe was a direct war crime when they actually went to engage in Kuwait. They had taken the youngest conscripts, the 16, 17-year-old conscripts, not the Republican Guard, but just the, the chaff of the military, and put them up in trench warfare lines all along the desert in front of the American troops. So these kids are down in the trenches. Well, they, they moved forward with tanks and, and, uh, and other equipment as a line toward these trenches. They put helicopters into the air that have these guns that will fire like 3,600 rounds in a, in a second. I mean, there's 1.1 billion tons of depleted uranium in America right now that they've got to get rid of. And this is the way they're getting rid of it. They're hurling it all around the world. And just blanket lead across a, a given area. And they started firing down into the trenches. And the people started trying to put up white flags and... Uh, and, and, and they specifically shot at anybody that was trying to surrender. That was one of the things that Timothy McVeigh was known for in the Gulf War, was, was being somebody that would shoot at a white flag. But that was common, that they would go after the people who were trying to surrender. So they wouldn't let the troops surrender. They shot into the trenches and kept them trapped in the trenches with this massive fire. And this is the way they're getting rid of it. They're hurling it all around the world. Meanwhile, the tanks put 
earth movers on the front, and they also had plows, and they pushed the desert sand forward and buried the people alive. And then the troops, and this was in the Washington Post, the troops marched behind and talked about seeing arms and hands wiggling of people still dying in the sand as they were marching over them. And, I mean, if you think the Vietnam vets had some traumatic stress disorder <laughs> problems, I think some Gulf vets are going to have some nightmares, too. And, but, I mean, to me, this is directly just a war crime. I mean, uh, the people trying to surrender, and they bury them alive, and then marched the troops through, but they defended them on the grounds that none of the U.S. troops were shot. Some people have described it that we will be at war with Iraq till the end of Earth because we cannot turn off the weapons that we used against Iraq. This is the time test. You have to be able to stop the weapons at the end of the war. Depleted uranium has a half-life of 4.5 million years, so um, we are at war with Iraq for the end of time. And at the time of the accident, I was asked in many scenarios, in many situations, what did I think of, of the safety of nuclear power plants? Based on the standards and the regulations of the NRC at the time, I said a very simple thing. I said, based on those standards and what we know and what our, our, our regulations are today, the majority of plants are operating safely. They're operating within those limits. Hanford got 41 miles of open pit down there that are not even lined. You going to fix that, Greg? I know this sounds incredible to people, but there are 40 miles of unlined trenches at Hanford, if you stretch them end to end, into which our federal government, your government, was dumping radioactive waste from nuclear weapons production and its own reactors until the year 2004 when we put those pictures um, on air and in our campaign literature for Initiative 297. Um, it's been against the law for decades for a municipal government to dump un in municipal garbage in unlined landfills, but our federal government thinks it's okay for radioactive waste, even though it seeps right out of those trenches, and, and that stuff is all moving through the soil to the Columbia River. Hanford's got 450 billion gallons dumped into the soil out of the containers, directly into the soil. You're going to fix they're, that? What they're not telling the public is that they also deliberately dumped out of the high-level nuclear waste tanks in the 1950s and 1960s billions of gallons of liquids into the soil. And it is very, very toxic. It is radioactive. It includes uranium that with half-lives of hundreds of thousands of years and plutonium and technetium-90 and strontium-90 and technetium-99, excuse me, and all sorts of chemicals as well and um, it's a witch's brew of deadly wastes, and it's all moving towards our lifeblood, the Columbia River. Uh, this is probably the most dangerous stuff on the planet ever. Uh, very, very small quantities of this waste. Um, and it's been said that a Dixie cup full of this waste in a crowded restaurant, everyone would be dead in the restaurant inside of an hour. If Even the amount that would fit on the leg of a fruit fly uh, is considered a problem dose. And that's happened at Hanford. Fruit flies have landed on contaminated materials and then flown off to go to the lunchroom and deposit contamination on food and on tables and whatnot. And they've had to evacuate a 20 acre area at the Hanford site because of uh, hot fruit flies and wasps. So this, this waste in these tanks is very dangerous in small quantities. And it has another feature, which is it's dangerous for very, very long periods of time. You got 45,000 barrels dumped off the coastline of San Francisco, 30 kilometers in. How are you going to fix that? But it don't stop there. Off the coastline of California, 30 kilometers from San Francisco, a huge, massive city, your loving government dumped 47,500 barrels containing them plutonium, cesium, strontium, the most toxic stuff on the planet. That's 2.5 million gallons or 18 million Dixie cups of the most toxic stuff on this planet. This is your government done this to you. This is the people that say they're going to protect you. This is the people that scream about someone might set off a dirty bomb. Dirty bomb. This is what they scream about all the time. One can imagine an enormous amount of disruption, even if a very small uh, dirty bomb were 
detonated. To counter the danger, an unprecedented effort to equip first responders with radiation detectors. From the city to the suburbs, remember. And I made a very important addition to that. And I said, but if we need and we identify areas and, and challenges and things that need to be fixed, then we will make sure that we implement those those recommendations, that we implement well, those Hanford lessons. Well, has 200 square miles of contaminated groundwater uh, below the site there, and that is spreading over time because the contaminants in the soil are leaking at a constant rate into the, uh, you know, into the groundwater. But when I was chairman at the NRC, one of the complaints I heard from the industry repeatedly was that there were not enough experts to go back and reassess and reanalyze the seismic impacts on nuclear power plants. My first thinking was, shouldn't we have been doing this all along? Why all of a sudden now do we have to hire all these people to now go on and conduct these assessments and these analyses? Why isn't this something that was being done on a routine and regular basis? Now, just taking one other issue, an issue that throughout the rest of the world, including in Japan, has become an obvious issue and an obvious area that currently operating plants need to address, the so-called filtering of hardened vents. The commission outright rejected making requirements to filter the vents on nuclear power plants. And essentially what this means is in the event of an accident when pressure has to be released to reduce the impact from the accident. They have an accident. So what he's trying to say is that they don't do anything until there's an accident and people are screaming, then they'll go out and try to pacify him. We're trying to keep the monster alive. That the material that's released will be scrubbed of radioactive contamination, a way to further reduce the contamination around the site and to people off-site from the reactor. Well, that would be admitting that you're leaking into all the communities and in everybody's rivers and oceans and that you have releases all the time. And the fact is you don't even have the technology to do it because you put all your technology into making directed energy weapons. You don't even need the isotopes you're creating to make power. You've been doing it for, what, 50 years? And all the new isotopes you're creating are for directed energy weapons. They got nothing to do with power. That's how you're getting in all of these problems. That's why they're so big, these plants are so dangerous, is because you're making them big and dangerous to create the weapons isotope, the weaponized isotopes. So unfortunately, what we see is a process in which delay <coughs> continues to be used instead of actual solutions to problems from an industry that claims it is incredibly technologically advanced, that is incredibly focused on safety. The solution to the problems is not creating the problem in the first place and trying to bury it and hide it, marginalize it and lie about it, and manipulate everybody into thinking that it's insignificant potassium-40 is all it's going to turn into, like Ken Buesler from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution does all the time in lectures and radio interviews. Now, I do want to put this in perspective from health safety. I'm not a, a health physicist by any stretch. But I do want to point out, and I'll go back to, you know, there are about 12 becquerels of potassium-40 in bananas. There are levels of concern for drinking water in the U.S. It's about 8,000 in those units. So they have a regulatory limit of about 90,000. So they're allowed by law to put up to about 90,000 becquerels per cubic meter of cesium in the ocean by the operating license of TEPCO. Our plants have similar things. They're allowed to have certain levels in the ocean. That's because these are considered safe. You would have to eat 20 million bananas to get the same amount of radiation from a single isotope from Fukushima. But so let's look at where we are in the United States and in Japan today. At Fukushima Daiichi, there continues to be challenges with cleanup and water management at the site. As Prime Minister Khan talked about, there is an issue with groundwater contamination. So while the immediate accident is over, you got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tons of radioactive water pouring into that ocean every single day, nonstop. The site is polluted with pieces of the MOX fuel rods from the detonations of Unit 3, not to mention Unit 1, not to mention Unit 4, three melted cores. You got all the water running underneath that site out into the ocean, flushing all those isotopes constantly out into the ocean. There's 300 tons that TEPCO was pouring on it that day 
say is all is getting out there, but how are you going to get away from the rain and the snow washing down through all that topsoil? How are you going to get away from it washing all the radioisotopes all around Japan back out into the ocean? How are you going to get away from that being liberated, carried up into the jet streams, carried into rain onto other continents? The challenges from this accident continue. And I think to some extent the good thing that has come out of some of the recent reports and the recent contamination events has been a renewed focus on this, on this tragedy in Japan. It's a non-stop contamination event. It's an extinction level event for the Pacific Ocean. It polluted the entire northern hemisphere and there's something good that came out of this so that you can keep nuclear power alive for a little bit longer. Is that what it is? I hate to see you down in Japan, man. I think they'll string you up. And as long as there's a significant source of contamination there, that will ultimately lead to continued contamination of the sea and the groundwater around the site. It can't stop polluting. It can never stop. It's got a 4.5 billion year half-life just from the MOX fuel that blew up all over that site. They can't pick up those pieces. They can't even find them anymore. Because they went through that nuclear chain reaction, the neutrons and the x-rays from all these chunks all over that site are producing unimaginable isotopes that are being released into the environment till the end of time. There's nothing they can do with that site. If they bury it under a mile of dirt, it's still going to hemorrhage out from underneath it. But ultimately, the international credibility of the Japanese nuclear industry is at stake, and with that... Credibility. How can you have credibility against something that you can't stop, against something you can't protect, against something you can't decontaminate, you can't filter, you can't save the Pacific Ocean, you can't change the fact that North America was rained on constantly by radioactive fallout and will continue for many decades. If we're lucky, it'll stop then. It's not likely, though. There was such a big release, and it's so toxic. But there will be, for decades, a cleanup activity at the site at Fukushima. There will be the water management issues. There will be the removal of spent fuel pool. There will be decontamination of communities in the hopes that some people may be able to return to their communities. But after years and years and years, it's hard for a community to be brought back together. Leaving it there till the end of time. But nuclear power is okay. We'll get the kinks out of it. You can trust us. We won't lie to you. We won't manipulate you. We won't send out Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution scum buckets to lie, manipulate, and deceive the population at all. No, we don't need to do that because everything is fine, right? There will be the removal of the melted fuel or perhaps the inability to remove the fuel and the need to simply leave it in place. But how dare you? What, are you going to decontaminate Japan at the same time? Are you Are going to decontaminate the Pacific Ocean at the same time? Are you going to decontaminate the Northern Hemisphere? The U.S. government's own model over a 40-day period showed the entire Northern Hemisphere polluted by cesium-137. You can't have cesium-137 without 30 times more strontium because of the fuel you used in Japan. 30 times more strontium-90 because of that MOX fuel, which is missiles, nuclear missiles, that have been remilled into more potency. And then ultimately, some type of decommissioning of these reactors, a process that will take probably my entire life to finally be completed. It's an outrageous lie. It's an unbelievable, unimaginable outrageous lie, he just said. They can't do anything with this stuff. They can't even build a sarcophagus to put it in. All their licensing says that they have that stuff, but they actually don't. They're talking about Yukon Mountain at the Senate hearings a few days ago as the last ditch effort to find a place to put all of this stuff, and they never mentioned the waste. 2.5 million bullets a month of uranium-238, which is left over from the process of this stuff, from making nuclear power, the military-industrial complexes, um, militarized isotopes, Uranium-238 is fired in other people's countries non-stop. This is the stuff that he won't talk about, but that he's supposed to talk about, that he's supposed to acknowledge, and then he can't because he'll get people like me coming out there and dropping them on his fucking head. But the management of spent fuel in the long term had been solved and resolved, and the industry was able to move forward in a thriving way with a new generation of bright young people willing to pursue this technology because it truly was beneficial. 
So what's the sense of having these people in position if they're just going to let the industry do whatever it's want? Right? What's the sense of it? That's his way of telling you that he has no control and he only does what he's told.